right, good evening. Good to see you this evening. Glad you came to the house of the Lord tonight. Glad you're here now, because if you were getting here in a few minutes, you would be getting very wet and very blown away. So glad to be in a place where we have shelter from the storm. That's a blessing. We'll pray and begin our service with page number 205 as the deer in just a moment. We'll open a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for displays of your power. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us today already in your house. We pray you please bless us tonight. Help us to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Page number 205 in your hymn books as the deer. Let's stand and sing page 205. Sing this twice through, twice through, number 205. As the deer panted for the waters of my soul, on its after you, you alone are my heart's desire, and I long to Let's turn to page 375, 375. We'll sing the first three verses and have some fellowship. 375.
please lead, and then the gentleman will follow. So, number four. And Lord, peace the day. Maybe we should be singing all hail the power of whatever that song is. I don't know. Sounds like it might be hailing out there. Anyone want to run outside and jump into puddles? No. All right. Well, by way of announcements, uh, just the baby, remember the baby shower for the Powells? Not shower, the baby display. Shower of love, let me say it the right way. That'll end next Sunday, so be conscious of that. And then a young adult activity coming up on April the 27th. And, of course, remember the prayer time on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Uh, if you can make it out for that. And I believe that's all of our announcements, I think. All right. So, Jacob, you're smiling big tonight. Uh, you like thunderstorms? Or <laughs> Whatever. Would you pray for us? Thank you. Dear Lord, I... Thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together this evening. Uh, Lord, thank you for a place where we can gather uh, safely, uh, Lord, in your name. Uh, Lord, I pray you'd be with the pastor as he brings your word. Uh, Lord, I pray you'd just be with this offering, Lord, that your will would be done with it. Uh, Lord, bless all those who give, and Lord, bless all that's given. And Father, I pray this in your precious holy name. Amen. Well, we've got one missionary update letter for you before we begin, and uh, we're going to start having some of the young men of the church read these. So if you're 
not afraid to take a stab at African village names and things like that in front of a crowd of people, let me know. I want to have some people I can hand this off to to uh, share in being able to update everybody. And so I just kind of picked one out of the hat today, and this is one that I'm not familiar with, so I'm excited to get to know them a little better. But this is the Bullock family in Mallorca, Spain. And this is their letter from March of 2024. It says, Dear Pastor, Church, Family, and Friends, I hope you have had a good start to 2024. Our year is going well so far, aside from some sickness and a few car troubles. I guess even on an island in the Mediterranean Sea, the everyday things are still the same. The weather here is perfect right now. On Saturday, Nick and Sam went to the park to play some basketball while Christy and I went on a date and enjoyed a view, the view of the water in the sailboats. <coughs> Sorry, the church is doing well. We had our annual field uh, friend day the last Sunday of February. We ended up having 38 people this past Sunday and Wednesday. We had four first-time visitors in each service. A few were from out of town, but we were praying the rest will come back again. Last year, we went to the fair as a youth group. In a few weeks, we will all go again but this time decided to make it a church-wide activity. Two con constant prayer requests have been in a place like this, uh, our jobs and paperwork. Recently, God has answered several of those prayers for our church family, Carlos and Runelli's, the missionaries uh, out of our church are doing well and staying busy. We just celebrated Runelli's birthday with her favorite dessert, a giant chocolate chip cookie. On Tuesdays, they have started the Bible study out in Port and, uh, Andrats. Uh, on Wednesdays, we have church. Sometimes he preaches. Thursday evenings, they do discipleship with a family. And on Fridays, they take a group out soul winning. On Saturdays, he works at the church. And on Sundays, he teaches the adult Sunday school while she heads up the nursery. On top of all that, they both work jobs. Their support level has gotten up to about 30%. Please continue to pray for this as this is our biggest prayer request right now. I would once again like to ask that you consider this wonderful family and, uh, uh, and pray for them. Thank you for all that you do for us. And that is the Bullock family in Mallorca, Spain. So there's an update for you there. All right. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter number 3. 1 Samuel chapter number 3. <clears throat> It's encouraging to hear that the word was well received this morning. Hope it'll be the same tonight. Uh, this morning was not a real joyful passage in the Bible. Tonight is a little more uplifting, and we've got a chorus to listen to as I preach. So if a big thunder hits, just know the Lord's agreeing with me, <laughs> and we're going to be all right. <laughs> First Samuel chapter number three, and uh, we're going we're gonna to read a bit of this. A, a little bit of it will be re, you know, recapping from the morning service, but um, uh, but it'll just start with verse 1, and then we'll pray. The Bible says, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word and all that it teaches us. Lord, help us to trust it with our lives and with our eternity. Lord, help us to uh, grow thereby. Lord, we love you. I pray, please help me as I preach. In Jesus' name, amen. So the word of the Lord is precious in those days. There was no open vision. Um, and when the Bible says the word of the Lord was precious, we know the word precious means of great value or worth or very valuable. Um, but but it's, it's not, I, from the context and from knowing the situation of the time when this was written, I don't believe what he's saying is everybody held the word of God as precious to them. He's saying, no, it was very valuable. It was very precious um, as a result because, because there was no open vision. Because so few people had the word of God, it was a precious thing. You think of precious metals and precious stones and things like that. If I were to just go pick up a rock outside, the odds are it would not be gold. If it was, praise God. But the odds are it's not going to be gold. It's not going to be diamond. It's not even going to be jasper or onyx. It's probably just going to be whatever you call these normal old everyday rocks that are worth nothing. And they're worth nothing because they're everywhere. And if something is precious, it's usually because it's rare. It's often because there's so little of it in the world, just like with gold and with diamonds and pearls and things like that. That makes something precious. Um, the Bible talks about a virtuous woman. You know, that's a precious thing. And uh, partly because it's hard to find. And same thing about a good man. A good man is hard to find. And so there's a lot of things in our life that are precious because of how rare they are. And in this day and age in the Bible that we're looking at, the word of God was very precious, not that everybody thought, oh, praise God, it's the word, I love it dearly, but because it was so rare, uh, and so it was held to. 
uh, because of that. Now, <clears throat> sorry, I've got to clear all these storm alerts from my iPad so I can see my notes. Um, the no open vision. Now, this does not mean there was no plan. I, a lot of times people in churches will use the, you know, use the verse Proverbs twenty nine eighteen, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law happy is he. And they'll use that as, so this is our vision for the year for the church. Nothing wrong with that. But the word vision in this context and in, in, in the context of Proverbs, uh, the word vision refers more so to the law of God, to the word of God. Uh, the vision is, is the message from God. And so... Obviously, the word vision is used in the Bible to describe a visual vision that somebody receives from God, like a prophet, but the word vision is often also used at, in this regard of there is no vision, there is no word of God, there is no direction from God. And so when there is no open vision, um, that's a problem. When the people of God don't have a direction to go, that's a big deal. When the word of God is precious because of its rarity, that's a hard thing. Now, we have our Bibles, and we're thankful for them, I hope, and we hold them dear to us, and we consider them precious, I hope. Hope, but somebody who has never had a Bible in their language and receives the Bible in their language for the first time, I'll bet you they treat it a lot more precious than we do. Because if mine tears, I'll be sad. I'll be upset. But I'll go get another one. But if this was the only copy of the Word of God I had and could ever have in my life, boy, you, you'd tell what? I'd tell you what, I'd be really careful with this thing. It'd be very, very more, much more precious to me because of its rarity, because of the fact I can't replace it. Now, we're reminded that in Judges 21, 25, as concerning the time frame of Israel in the beginning of 1 Samuel, the Bible said in that last verse of Judges chapter 21, in those days there was no king in Israel, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So nothing has changed that we're aware of in this day and age, and so Samuel's day, people are doing whatever they deem right, and there's no direction from God. That's a very bad combination to have no direction from God and everyone just doing whatever they think is right. Now, we see times like today where we do have direction from God and still people will just go and do whatever they feel is right, but at least we have direction from God. At least those who want to follow the Lord can because they have it available. Uh, but in this day and age, there is no open vision. There, there is no direction from God and people are just doing whatever they think is best. And that's not a good way to go about life. Now, um, we have an open vision here in the U.S. today. We have access to the Word of God, and so that's a, that's a blessing. We come to verse number 2 of 1 Samuel chapter 3. The Bible says, And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. I think it's interesting note here that we have, because if you think back to the morning message, if you think back to chapter 2 and verse number 33, the Bible said, And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes. And so you think when you read through that, that sounds like an odd statement to make, that there's going to be someone to consume Eli's eyes. And then we come down to chapter 3 and verse 2, and it talks about his eyes going dim and him not having his eyesight. So every part of God's prophetic uh, message to Eli about what would happen to him has come to pass. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to laugh because I can't hear myself, and I'm just assuming you can hear me. Um, no? Okay, and nobody can hear me. All right, well, we're all getting a lip reading uh, chance tonight. <laughs> Now, don't go away from here saying, did you hear what the preacher said? <laughs> Apparently nobody did. <laughs> All right. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse number 3. <laughs> and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou calledst me. And he said, I called her. The phrase, Here am I, is used 16 times in the Bible by nine different men. And it's, it's used in this, in, by these men in this order. Abraham, Abraham, Esau, Jacob, Jacob, Joseph, Jacob when he's called Israel, Moses, Samuel, 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 the Amalekite who killed Saul, David, and Isaiah. And so that's an interesting list to me. And if you look at those who made the statements in response to God or an angel of God, then the list is Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Samuel, and Isaiah. So we have in that list, we have two patriarchs, the man God used to deliver Israel from Egypt, a judge prophet in Samuel, and a prophet in Isaiah. 
that's a pretty good list of people. That's a pretty good group to be lumped in with. And so it got me to considering, um, I believe men who ignore or hide from God's call are often successful. Now, I don't mean successful in life or successful in ministry. I mean they're successful in accomplishing nothing for God because they hide from or ignore God's call. Here we find men who did great things for God, men who are very prominent figures in the word of God, and all of them were men who said, here am I. Men who who heard the call of God and responded to the call of God. There are plenty of examples in the Bible where you see someone who is given an opportunity and they do not take it and you never hear from them again. You never hear about them again because they've never, they don't do anything else in their life. If God starts working on your life and calling you to do something for him, don't ignore that. Don't hide from that. It's a privilege. It's a blessing. You answer God's call like Samuel, as we'll see in a little while, answers, speak for thy servant heareth. Lord, what would you like me to do? Lord, what are you trying to tell me? Or answer like Isaiah in Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Uh, now, that's a place in the life that a lot of Christians never truly get to where they'll just say, Lord, whatever you want, wherever you want me to go, I'm here, I'm ready to be used, send me. There's a lot of people who would probably make that claim to say, I'm willing, I'm willing, I'm willing. But then when God does make the call, well, I was, I, I'm willing, but not quite that willing. I'm willing, but not for that place. I'm willing, but not for that job. And uh, I, I think it's sad, you know, when somebody gives you a job to do who is over you, especially God, you don't say, well, that's not the job I want to do. No, that, that's, that's not your role. You don't have that authority. You say, thank you, Lord, for counting me worthy to have a job to help you in the ministry to do something for the Lord. Now, you notice what Samuel did in verse number five. If we go back to verse number five, the Bible says, and he ran unto Eli. Now, remember, Samuel has just laid down and went to sleep. I don't know about you, um, I've gotten to the point now, like when we had Adeline, our first daughter, you know, when, when we would hear a noise in the night, uh, you know, I felt like I was a pretty good dad. I might wake up here and there and, you know, check on her. But my wife, she's the one that got the brunt of it. You know, there's, there's a little squeak and it's poof, out of bed, ready to go. What's going on? Are they alive? Are they okay? You know, that's, that's kind of, that's how moms are and that's okay. That's how God made you. Now we have four kids and it's like, all right, how loud was the sound? Do we need the gun or do we, can we just ignore it? And, and so... Samuel went to bed. He goes to sleep. The Lord, the Lord calls to him, and he pops up, and he doesn't just get out of bed. He runs to Eli. Now, that's, that's some uh, dedication there. Well, you get me out of bed in the middle of the night, and you just say, hey, Pastor Jeff, I probably won't even get out of bed. I'll say, what do you want? <laughs> or if it's the phone, you know, hello, and try to clear your throat ten times, make it sound like you weren't totally asleep. Hello. <laughs> Y'all are looking at me like I'm the only one that does that. Come on. You sleep in one day and somebody calls you and you don't want them to know you were in bed. You're like, uh, mm, uh, uh, hello. <laughs> and then they're like, did I wake you up? Man, I thought I did so good. <laughs> but Eli is, or uh, Samuel runs to Eli when all Eli did, he didn't say, come quick, come quick. He just, he just calls him by name and he runs to him. There's an eagerness to serve there. There's an eagerness to serve. Now, um, our, pa our youth pastor, of course, our pastor now in Michigan, uh, he used to use the guilt trip on us. I don't know if any of you have, have been, had this used on you before, but he would ask the teenagers, anybody have a servant's heart today? And what that meant was he had a job nobody would want to do, but he was going to give it to us. And so he would guilt trip us. You know, do you have a servant's heart? So if you ever ask, hear me ask you that, it means there's something you might not want to do that I'm about to ask you to do. You have a servant's heart. And, and that's the thing, you know, do you have to be guilted into doing something or are you right there ready to go, let's do it, let's go get at it? Uh, that's a different attitude we see from Samuel. He runs to Eli's side. He doesn't even understand that it's God calling him yet. He just thinks it's Eli. And yet he's willing to get out of bed and run to him, uh, not just walk, not just groggily drag his self over there. He just, he runs to Eli and say, what do you need? And uh, then we continue in verse number six. Oh, praise the Lord. It's quieted down a little bit. Normally you want it loud in the church, right? You want to hear amen, praise God, all that stuff. That was a little too loud. 
And the Lord called yet again Samuel, and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here, I am, here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called thee not, my son, lie down again. Now, if you're Samuel, after the second time, you've got to be wondering, am I crazy or is he crazy? Because you got out of bed twice hearing your name, and you went to him and said, Hey, you called me, what do you need? And he said, I didn't call you, go back to bed. If this was me and my dad, I would guarantee that he's just playing a prank on me. Like, why are you, what are you doing this for? But we don't see any questioning from Samuel. We don't see any argument. We don't see any attitude or any grumpiness or anything like that. He just goes back, lies down again. Verse number seven. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie lie down, and it shall be if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood. And called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Now, that is, um, it's a blessing to see that in all of this, it, it may seem like a minor detail, but especially looking at the state of things today in our culture, to have somebody who, they hear the call, they come and you say, I didn't call you, go back. Three times that, that happens, and they don't get mad. They don't get upset. They don't get grumpy or or frustrated. They just, uh, this is what he did. He, He went and he heard, he responded, he received, and he obeyed. So he heard the call, he responded to the call, and then he received instruction, he obeyed the instruction. The instruction was go back, get back in bed. And he just did that over and over and over again and never changed and never, never stepped in and said, hey, please stop calling me if you don't have anything for me to do. I want to go to bed. That's what most of us would probably have said. But we come to verse number 10, and and in verse number 10, the Lord starts speaking to Samuel, and Samuel really is coming onto the scene here, um, and we read it all this morning. We have time. We'll, We'll go through it again tonight. Verse number 11, the Bible says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel lay unto the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared, feared to shew Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, here am I. Now, I want to speak for a moment on this fear that, that Samuel has to, to speak this truth to Eli. Now, when it comes to the Word of God, we as Christians today, we all have the the ability to get into the Word of God and get a message from the Lord. And we all have the ability and the commission to take messages from God to other people, whether it be to correct a brother in love, whether it be to tell a witness to a lost stranger or a lost loved one, whatever it may be, we have a commission from God to take his word to others, and it's not always a pleasant message. It's not always a joyful, happy message, or at least we know it won't be received as that. At least with us, with salvation today, you know, you have on one hand, if you don't trust Christ as your Savior and and repent of your your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll die and you'll go to an eternity in in the lake of fire. And that sounds very bad and very negative, and it is. But we can say, but praise God, God loved you enough to send you Jesus Christ. He loved you enough to die on the cross for you. So we at least have the other side of the story. We at least have the positive to go with the negative. And so with Samuel, all he had for Eli was negative. All he had, her whole message for Eli was you've messed up and God's going to wipe you out. And so there was no positive spin to be put on that message. And, and that's, that's how it is sometimes. And so I understand where he says, you know, he feared to, to reveal that message to Eli. Hold your place in 1 Samuel with me and turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, especially towards the beginning of my preaching ministry when I was a young man just starting off preaching. Jeremiah chapter 1, I about wore that out of my Bible because uh, I don't think many people knew this in my circle of friends or anything, but 
um, I would often, uh, when I would get asked to preach, uh, when I would get asked to do a youth rally or whatever, uh, different places, different things, um, if I got nervous at all, if I got fearful at all about getting up and, and preaching, I would go to Jeremiah chapter 1. And, and I did that often. And I still do sometimes just to this day just because it's a blessing. It's a help to you. Um, look with me starting in verse number 5. The Bible says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have set thee, uh, set this day, sorry, see, I have set uh, this day, set thee over the nations to, and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. And so he, he tells Jeremiah that you're going to be a prophet, and, and he indicates that the message you're going to have isn't going to be necessarily well received, because he tells him, the first thing he tells him is, don't be afraid of their faces. And I don't know if you've ever done public speaking or anything, and you look out at the crowd and you see all the faces, and that's what terrifies some people. It, we, they could be smiling, happy faces, and it could still terrify you if you're one that's kind of afraid of that kind of thing or just not comfortable with that kind of thing. But sometimes, I can tell you from experience as a preacher, they're not smiling, happy faces. They're, they're either off in la-la land or they're unconscious. Maybe they're just looking like they want to hurt you. And uh, I've had some people in my life um, that, and, and I won't, if, if you're one of them, I'm not going to tell you this, but you look like you're mad at me no matter what I'm saying. And, and I know from the relationship we have, you're not mad at me. It's just really hard to read your face as I'm preaching, and i got to look at other people, because if I look at you, it's going to be discouraging. <laughs> There's, and and think, I'm, I'm, you say, is that me? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. But... <laughs> But then there's people that no matter what you're saying, they're just smiling at you. And you're like, man, I just want to look at that person the whole time I'm preaching. <laughs> but it's just, it so I understand exactly what he's saying here. Be not afraid of their faces. Then you skip down a few verses to verse number 17. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I can confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense, a defense city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land, and they shall fight against thee. He's just going to preach to them. He's not going to pick a fight. But he says, they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Now, Jeremiah is one, it's a book of the Bible, it's an amazing book of the Bible, but it can be a little bit of a downer because Jeremiah spends his life preaching the word of God to these people, and they never repent. We have not one instance, one verse to look to in all of Jeremiah to say he at least convinced one person to follow God. He got He got nothing. You think about, you know, measuring a preacher based on the response, Jeremiah would be a dud, but, but he just faithfully preached God's word. He ended up in prison for it. He ended up witnessing firsthand the captivity with all of it, and, uh, and he just, just not, in, not the preacher's life that is, you know, put out there on Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff of, you know, look at my Bible and my coffee and my, uh, sorry, that's not me. I'm not trying to pick fun of people, but anyways. Jeremiah was not that type of ministry. Jeremiah preached and preached and preached and people hated him and hated him and hated him and it never got better for him uh, until one day he passed on and he went to be with the Lord. Praise God. That's some good rewards he built up there. And it's the same today even. I mean, you think about Elijah threatened with death. Uh, the New Testament, John the Baptist is beheaded because he goes and he tells the king that it's not lawful for him to have his brother's wife. And, and the king's not the one that gets mad. It's the lady that gets mad and she ends up getting his head on the platter. And so preaching the word of God and declaring the word of God can be a fearful thing. Uh, because you don't know how it's going to be received. You could be preaching a message. You could be telling somebody something about God's word that you think is so joyful, so happy, and it just hits a chord with them just right that they are mad at you about it. And you don't realize, what, what did I say? 
you know, what did I say? What was so bad about that message? But sometimes you just don't know. And so the preaching of the word of God, I can see where people would be afraid to do that. And with Samuel, the message he has for Eli is certainly a fearful message to deliver. Then uh, Exodus chapter 20 with me, if you would. Exodus chapter number 20. Not just proclaiming the message of God can be a fearful thing, but even just hearing from the Lord himself in Exodus chapter 20, we have the Ten Commandments given. We have God speaking from the mountain and the thunderings and the storm and all of that. Not like, unlike tonight, but um, he's, he's doing this. And we, we'll start reading, we'll pick up in verse number uh, 18. So God gives the Ten Commandments. And in verse 18, the Bible says, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. They said, if God speaks to us again, we're going to die. Just from, the, just from God speaking to them. You say, I wish God would speak to me. They didn't. They witnessed it firsthand. The thunderings and the lightning. See, we like the idea of the still, small voice speaking to us. And that, that happens. Praise God. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the Word of God to guide us. That happens. But here in, in, in Israel's day, God didn't speak like that. He spoke through thunder and lightning and, and the storm and, and all of that. And they said, if God keeps talking to us, we're going to perish. We're going to die. And so I think it's, it's amazing to me how much lost people prove the power of the word of God by their response to it. You start talking about the Bible, you start quoting verses, and boy, they can, some of them, they'll get mad, they'll get upset, they'll change the subject as quick as possible, like they're just trying to literally run away from you, because the Word of God has power. Even if it's not God's voice thundering from heaven, your voice speaking the Word of God to somebody, that conviction that brings, it terrifies people sometimes. And uh, boy, you ever want to get through a crowded airport or something like that, just open up your Bible and hold it in front of you and just start preaching as you walk, and they'll part like the Red Sea. You'll be, you'll be fine. It'll be a quick way to get through a crowd. So we have Samuel is, is afraid to declare to Eli all that God has given him to declare to Eli, and I understand that, um, but what does, he, what does he do? Back in 1 Samuel chapter 3, we read in verse number 17, and he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. And Samuel told him every wit, and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. Samuel told him every wit, and hid nothing from him. Every Christian, as I, as I mentioned, is commanded by God to seek his word and to share it, to hear, to get word from God and to share it with others. John 5, 39 says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. 2 Timothy 2, 15, one that you'll probably know, study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Written to a young pastor, but I, I believe applicable to all of us, 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. In Ephesians 4, verse 14 and 15, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. God showed Samuel all that would happen to Eli, and Samuel was afraid to pass it on, but he did, and he gave all of it to Samuel. He told him every wit had nothing from him. Um, as someone with access to God's word, and that's you today. If you're here today, you have access to God's word. If you don't have your own Bible, you got one in front of you in the pew, maybe, depending on where you're sitting, and uh, we have them for you. We have very easy access to God's word. And if you're saved, you're a child of God, then you have that responsibility to speak to family, friends, even strangers, as the Holy Ghost leads you about the things of God, whether it be about salvation or whether it be correcting an errant brother or, or somebody that you know that's just making about to make a bad decision or a wrong decision according to the word of God, and you have an, a responsibility, an obligation as a Christian to take that message from God and in love declare that message to them for their help, for their benefit, for their protection. And we have that responsibility. It's not always easy, 
And it's not always something that we desire to do because we don't want to mess up the relationship or we don't want to be looked down on or we don't want to be mocked or whatever it may be. It's not necessarily that easy every time to do that. But if we'll do it, we'll be obedient to God. Now, look with me at uh, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 25. I want to show you this. This is uh, the Apostle Paul speaking. Acts chapter 20. He's nearing the end of his ministry and he's making some declarations concerning that. Acts chapter 20, verse number 25. The Bible says, And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All the counsel of God. For, Eli, for Samuel, with Eli, it was every wit. Every bit. For, for Paul, it was all the counsel of God. For you, it's every single thing in the word of God that the Holy Spirit leads you to tell somebody without holding anything back. Now, there's been plenty of Christians who maybe they were well-meaning, maybe they weren't, but they used the word of God to, to talk to somebody and they did it poorly. They did it out of anger. They did it out of self-righteousness, whatever that may be. And that's not what I'm promoting here, but what I'm promoting here is, is don't let fear keep you from telling people the message that God has for them. It's not just the pastor's job or the teacher's job or the prophet's job or the, or the, the missionary's job or the parent's job. It's every Christian's job to get in the word of God, get the word of God for ourselves and get so much of it that there's just bubbling over. And we can, we can share scripture with a friend and encourage them. We can share scripture with a stranger and try to lead them to the Lord. We can share scripture with someone who is out of the will of God and try to recover them. All of that is stuff that we are supposed to be doing. Now, we do use discernment um, in this. Uh, there was a, a, one of the very first youth, like big youth activities I ever did as a youth pastor. Um, my wife's smiling because she knows this story. Uh, I was still, I think I was still 18, maybe 19. I had just, just become the youth pastor, and it was the big canoe trip, the camping and canoe trip. And I want to say we had three teenagers and like seven adults. It was, I mean, when it comes to odds, they were in our favor for things to go well, but they didn't. And so we're, the whole trip, it's just raining, it's pouring, everybody's miserable. We go to do devotions, and so we do devotions in the 15-passenger van because it's the only dry place. And so, because we're just camping at a campground. So we're in there, and it's just me and Michelle and one of the workers and the kids. And we're, it, to me, it seemed like we're finally breaking through and, and actually getting some soft hearts, getting some reception. And that, that was just that was my take on it. I don't know if that was everybody's take on it, but we were we were going along, we were having devotions, and then the door of the of the van opened up, and one of the one of the ladies that was a helper stuck her head in, and she just kind of started looking at everybody, and I thought it was really awkward, and I'm like, oh, what do I do here? Like she just staring us all down, and and then uh, I I asked or she said or something. I think I said, you know, can we help you? And and she was just checking on us and wanted to know when we'd be done. And I was a very naive young preacher boy, and I just answered the best I knew how. I said, well, we'll be done whenever the Lord's done with us. And I wasn't trying to be rude or anything, but then I, later on I'm like, yeah, it's probably kind of a little rude. Well, that wasn't the problem. The problem was we get out of the van after a little while longer, and the kids start heading to their tents, and all of a sudden there's a commotion over by the adults. And the adults are arguing pretty loudly. And what, what turns out what happened was that the, the worker that was with me in the vehicle, he was a relatively new Christian, relatively young Christian. Well, he had read 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Anybody know that one by heart? Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. And he had went to her, and took it upon himself to inform her that that church, that van was a church service. And she interrupted the church service and she was out of the will of God by doing that. And boy, it wasn't that well received. <laughs> no. 
Turns out they were worried that I, that we were all dying in there from carbon monoxide poisoning or something because, you know, Lord can't be working in the van or anything. It's just Jeff preaching. But um, but they had sent her to check on us, and she checked on us, and then he came out and went right over to her and let her know about that. And uh, so that was, uh, that. needless to say, that didn't go over well. And uh, that you might know a verse that's perfect for a situation, and it might not be the right time to say it. Or you might not be the right person to say it. There are, there are things that I have had come into my mind over the years, especially when I was a youth pastor, where I would just say, all right, I know exactly what verse to tell this person right now, but I am a young man. It will be better received if the pastor tells them. And, and I, I remember times where I just had to restrain myself so bad because the verse pops in and you're like, well, it's Bible. I got to give it to them. It's like, you can. But you also got to let the Lord lead you as to, is it the right time and are you the right person? And are you in the right spirit about it? And are they in the right spirit about it? Because you can do a lot of harm with this Bible if you're not careful. But, you, but that's not usually most people's problem. Most people's problem is they don't want to touch it and they don't want to tell it because it's scary. And, uh, and Eli, uh, Samuel, who would be a great prophet of God, this very first message he receives from God, he's afraid to deliver it. I understand that. I get that. I've been in that position, not not the same message, but been in the position of being afraid to preach and to, to look out on people and to try to give something from God's word to people. I preached my first sermon when I was 15 years old, and I had an afternoon worth of heads up. That morning, the pastor said, you're preaching tonight. And I said, okay. And I preached on the King James Bible because it's the only thing I knew much about, and I really didn't know much about that. And I had five pages of notes, and I think it took about four minutes to go through them. And y'all, I mean, you, you'll find out quick, if I have five pages now, <laughs> we're going to be here a while. But I was, I, I remember thinking, I'm 15, and I'm, and I'm just got serious about God, like last week, and I'm supposed to give something from God's word to people who have been saved and in their Bible five times longer than I've been alive, four times longer than I've been alive. That was intimidating. That was terrifying. And, and so now I, I do my best. I try to encourage young people, young men, like preach. That's all right. We'll, we'll do it. And whenever we would have a young guy preach at the church, we would, we would almost be obnoxious. And I mean, he'd say where to go in the Bible. We'd say, amen, preach, just to encourage him, just kind of take that, that fear away. But I understand being afraid to share the, the word of God with people. Um, every Christian ought to be able to share the gospel, but it doesn't end there. There's a lot more in this Bible and there's something in this Bible for everything and for everyone. And, and it's all truth. It's all the word of God. And so the more message, the more we receive from the word of God ourselves, the more we will be able to administer that to others. And we ought not fear to do so. Um, especially the pastor, the teacher, the parent, they need to be strong in the word and not fear to speak up as the Lord leads. So what did God do for Samuel? When Samuel started to faithfully speak his word, when Samuel went beyond his fear and told everything to Eli as God had told him, the Lord rewarded Samuel for that. Go back with me to our passage in 1 Samuel chapter number 3, and I'll show you what the Lord did for him. And uh, it's a, it, it may not come across as such a blessing to you, but as a pastor, I fully understand this is a blessing as a, uh, that is got, given by God to Samuel here. Verse number 19 and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Isn't that amazing? It doesn't say everybody received everything he said and repented that day, but none of his words fell to the ground. He didn't just speak out to the air and nobody paid attention. People listened. When he had a word from God and he delivered a word from God, people paid attention to it. I mean, that's most of what we can ask as preachers nowadays is for people just to pay attention, <laughs> Praise the Lord. And, and, and if somebody gets some help, if somebody repents, if somebody gets right with God, praise God. But the first thing we ask is just, hey, hey, look here, look here. <laughs> Put the phone down. Stop thinking about lunch. Stop thinking about dinner. Stop thinking about whether there's a tree on your house right now. <laughs> Anybody have that thought yet? <laughs> now you do. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and, and so the Bible says God didn't let any of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And uh, if you're married, you know that's an amazing miracle of God because you've talked to your spouse several times and about something and they'll say, you never said that. 
and the preacher will preach. There have been times that I have preached a subject on Sunday morning, and on Sunday night, somebody has come to me and said, hey, do you think we could hear about exactly what I preached Sunday morning? <laughs> like, you were here. We just talked about that. <laughs> like, what were you doing? <laughs> and it's comical to me, but it's, it, it's, it's just how we are. It's how we are as people. And so for God to not let Samuel's words fall to the ground, that may be a, a little note, but it's, a, it's practically a miracle from God, uh, the way that he advanced Samuel's ministry in that way. Verse number 20, and all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So what we see here is as Samuel began to speak of God to others, God continued to reveal more of himself to Samuel. And I think the same concept still applies today. The more you start to actually witness to others about the Lord, the more he will reveal himself to you. The more you start witnessing, the more you're going to be in your Bible. Because you start witnessing to people, they're going to start asking questions, and you're going to want to know the answers, and you're going to get in your Bible, and God's going to see that, and he's going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to give them a little nugget of truth here, and I'm going to give them another one, and I'm going to give them another one. And before you know it, your walk with God has just transformed in a short amount of time because you started taking what he gave you and sharing it with others. That's what he wants us to do. And it's not just the gospel. Gospel first and foremost. Salvation first and foremost. But all of the word of God. We are instructed to take it, receive it, and to distribute it. To give it out to others so that they may know the truths that God has revealed to us as well and rejoices that, rejoice in them together. Uh, that The older generation is supposed to disciple and nurture and bring up the younger generation. It's not just the pastor's job to teach people the Bible. It's, it's grandma's job. It's grandpa's job. It's, it's, the, it's the, the woman in the church who's lived a godly life and can direct and guide some of the young ladies to live a godly life. It's the men of the church who have worked with their hands and trusted their God and lived a godly life and, and can show the, other young, the young men of the church how to do the same. And as God, as God gives us his word, if we'll turn around and give it out ourselves, he'll just give us more and more and more. And that's what we want. That's what we want. I hope you want to grow in your faith. I hope you want to grow in your walk with God, your knowledge of God, your knowledge of the Word of God. But God's not going to give you more if you just take, take, take for yourself. If you start to give it out and share that Word of God and share the blessings God gives you from His Word, He might just give you a little more. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your Word. Thank you for all that we learn from it. Lord, I pray you please help us uh, today to be encouraged by it, Lord. As we go our separate ways here shortly and return home, and Lord, as we look at the week before us, Lord, help us to be encouraged to get into your word. Help us to be encouraged not to fear sharing your word. Lord, help us to be willing to say, here am I, send me. Or here am I, you know, here, here am I, your servant heareth. Lord, help us to, to consider these things tonight as we go home. Lord, help us to, Lord, help these words not to fall to the ground, Lord, but help them to sink into our hearts and help them to change our, the way that we live this week, that we may share your word with others. We thank you for all this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I don't believe we'll have a, an invitation tonight. I think we'll just let her play the piano. We'll be dismissed. And